We're doing a series uh, called The Amazing Race at each of the locations. And so, you know, today I've been given the task to share God's Word. It's really not a task, it really is a blessing to always share God's Word. And we're going to talk about relationships and partnerships. And on this amazing race, we will discover the synergy of relationships, the power of partnerships, and the covenant agreement. You know, agreement is more than just a collection of conforming people. It's more than just a bunch of individuals putting all their talents and their abilities together. It's more than just a compilation of differences. It really is an amalgamation of hearts. Covenant is a union of lives all coming together to achieve what one person could never do alone. It's a fusion, a blending of callings fueled by a common cause. And covenant people share the burdens. And yet they divide up the grief so no man, no woman would be unable to carry that load. I want you to know today, we may not look like much, but the person next to you and in front of you and in back of you they're in agreement, covenant agreement with you. If they love the Lord, could somebody say amen? amen. Today we're going to realize your potential when you make the right relationships with the right people, make the right partnerships when you marry the right person and date the right individual. Relationships will make you or they will They will determine if you're going to be significant or just superficial. It's so important that we have the right partner on this amazing race called life. And we're all on a journey. Some of us may be different places in the journey, but we, if we're believers, we have a single destination. And I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to make heaven without you. I always tell people when they say, Pastor Marty, you know, you've been a blessing. Is there anything we can do for you? I always tell them, you can pray for my children and my grandchildren because I don't want you to make heaven without them. Every person here is important. The person next to you is important. You may not know their name, but I want you to know that we are all interchanged. Our hearts all with a common thread, a common goal. And that is that we would enter into covenant with God and that we would share heaven together and the promise of eternal life. So God is all about covenant. And he's all about agreement. Now, he has authored marriage. I know you may not think he has given you that husband or wife of yours. God didn't make a mistake. God has authored marriage, and he's called families into existence. Your children, your grandchildren are a blessing. You know, the old saying is, you know, I just so enjoy my grandchildren. You know, the old saying goes, you know, grandchildren are the reward for not killing your own kids. <laughs> See, God has given us all these things, all, you know, when, when you get married, that, that is a covenant that you take before God and before man. Relationships are important, vital. Rela you know, you know, relationships are vital. God is a covenant God, a covenant keeping God. Communion that we took is a covenant between you and God. You said, I do, today at this altar. We're called into relationship with the Lord. You know that the, that the altar, the tabernacle, the temple, the church, they were all meeting places with God. God was in their midst. I want you to know right now, God is here. He's going to meet your need. 
I don't know what your need is. And I would venture to say that there are people here today, you, you don't even know what you're in need of. You ever feel so perplexed in your heart that words could not explain what you're feeling? Anybody been there before? I've been there. I've been in, Brother Anthony, I've been in places in my life, you know, emotionally, where, where I could not put pen to paper and articulate how I felt or why I felt that way. But I want you to know that, that God knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. And if you're going through, he's going to get you through. And so we, today, we're going to establish a, 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 a covenant here. We're going to start a new relationship here. And so I'm going to share with you the importance of making and maintaining and moving forward in your relationship with the Lord. So if we want to win this amazing race, I can tell you right now, you're not going to do it on your own. You're going to have to take Jesus with you. That'll be the greatest decision you ever make in your life. And, and let, let, let me say this, mom and dad, if, if you ever want to make, if you ever want the best for your children, how, how, many, how many moms and dads do we have here? Raise your hand real hard. I want you to know, you, you, can, be, you, can, you can be a, a, a mother or, or, or a dad. You can be 25, 45. Let me tell you, my father is 94 years old, soon to be 95 years old. He still calls me his little buddy. See, you never outgrow your children. If anything, your relationship grows deeper and wider. A dad is always a dad. A mom's always a mom. And so I just want you to know that if you ever want to give your children the best thing you could ever give them, give them Jesus. I, I, I think it's great to give them a good education. Mom, dad, sacrifice. Put your kids through the best school you possibly can. But I, I'll tell you what, the best thing you could ever give that young man, that young lady is Jesus. Because when you're not around, he will be. And covenant is just another word for a covering and protection. So can someone say amen? So now I have the, ta the challenge and the task of reading you the most unusual of scriptures that go along with my opening. So if you have your Bibles or maybe on the screens here, we're going to talk about very extreme relationships. You're going to see two very, very extreme relationships, and it's found in Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 26. Now, could somebody say extreme? You're going to read about two very extreme relationships. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. So first of all, we see that, that Jesus was taking authority over a man, over a, oh, really over a demon that had control over a man that could not speak. When that demon left the man, the man who had been mute suddenly spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, by Beelzebub, which is the prince of demons, by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he's driving out these demons. And others tried to test the Lord by asking him for another sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can the kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drove out the demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. 
Now, if I drive out demons by Belzebub, by whom do you, do you followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. When the strong man, and that strong man here represents the enemy, when the strong man fully armed guards his own house, his own possessions are safe. But when someone's stronger, that's the, 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 that, that evil spirit. But when the stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away his armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through the arid or dry places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house where I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and it takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. We're going to talk about extreme, uh, extreme relationships today. So I'm here to tell you that no good can ever come out of a controlling, authoritative influence of sin. If there are some here today or someone that you know that thinks that they can live in sin and that good is going to come out of it, it's not going to come. No good will come out of sin. No good will ever come out of fornication and adultery. No good will come out of drunkenness or drug abuse. No good will come out of any sin that we commit. Rest assured that sin is for a season. And in the end, you will pay a heavy consequence for that relationship. See, sinning is the repeated act of disobedience. When people say, well, what is sin? Well, we're all born with a sin nature. Everyone here was born with the Adamic or the nature of Adam. But because we are born again, we are born not no longer of Adam, but we are born of Jesus. So, so uh, we have a new nature. Our sin nature has been passed away. Behold, God gives us a new nature. That's why today, if you, if you do not know Jesus, you need to know him if you wish to be born again. That's what born again really means. Born again doesn't mean uh, the church you go to. It doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't mean the denomination that you go to. It just means that you are now born of God. You have authority over the over that sin nature. As a matter of fact, that sin nature is dead. But sinning, the act of always sinning is a repeated act of disobedience. It is a cycle. Many of these cycles are generational. Generational means that there is a lineage of behavior. Sin goes from the, from the grandfather to the father to the son. That's why you ever read the, your Bible and there's that portion in the Bible that says, you know, Joe begat Mary who begat Harry who begat Tom, right? He say, why am I reading this? Because lineage is very important. Lineage tells us where we came from and who we are and where we're going. You see, and there are, there are generational or lineage uh, 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 sins that have plagued mankind. Sometimes you see it could be sexual abuse. It could be drunkenness in the household. But generational linear cur uh, curses are broken by the blood of Jesus. The blood at Calvary was a blood transfusion. That changed our spiritual DNA. I want you to know today, if you are saved because of the work done at Calvary, I want you to know that there's new blood running through your veins right now. I want you to know that housed in your heart is the presence of a holy God. I want you to know that if you know, you see, your denomination is not going to save you. Coming to church is not going to save you. But who you are in Jesus will save you. 
So if you're born again, I want you to know that you have a, a, a new father, a new heart. There is a new blood that flows through your veins. We have a heavenly father. Can someone say right relationship? But you see, Luke 11 isn't about sin. Our verse that, the verses that we read really is not about sin as much as it is about radical relationships. We see that this, this man had a demon in him, and Jesus came in and cast that demon out. See, Jesus encountered that man that was possessed. And I say was because Jesus will never leave you the way he found you. Jesus will never leave anyone the way they found them. I want you to know this morning that whatever condition of life that you're in, God will never leave you in this condition forever. God is a God that will transform and forgive and restore. So today you're in a place of great hope. You're in a place where God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can think or even ask. Now, a lot of people have questions about, you know, what is a demon? What, what, you know, how does all of that happen? You know, sometimes it's, it's sort of a spooky subject, but demons are disembodied beings seeking a dwelling place. Now, how many people believe that that demon that we just read about in the Scripture was, was real? I want you to know that that demon is still around today. That's what the Scripture says. It says that when Jesus cast it out, that demon was looking for another place to dwell in. You see, these, these, these demonic beings are, are spirits that are looking for a host. That's why, you, did you ever read this portion of Scripture where Jesus cast out the demons and put them in the swine, this herd of pigs, and they jumped off the they 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 jumped you know off the cliff into the river because they were looking for a dwelling place. That's why it's very important that that which is clean stays clean. That which is empty becomes filled with the Holy Spirit. Could someone say Amen? So this man had, a, had a, uh, a demon living and dwelling within him. Now, let me say this. There are, there are two major distinctions that I'd like to bring out this morning uh, when it comes to this topic of, of demonism. First of all, uh, a demon possession means that a person is under the control of a demon. Demon possession means a person is under the control of a, of a demon. But demon oppression means that you or that person is under the influence, not necessarily the control, but the influence of a demon spirit. Somehow, somewhere, this man in the scripture gave legal right and access to that unclean spirit. Modern day things, and you may say, well, Pastor Marty, is that... Is that for today? Does that really happen? Oh, yes, it does. I can tell you this. Uh, modern day things like Ouija boards, card readings, medians. You know, they have this woman, Sylvia Brown, and, and this other one, what's his name, John Edwards. These, these you know, when, when, when we play with these things, we're playing with, in darkness. Do you know that? Uh, most people that have been demon possessed uh, uh, was, you know, was possessed through a Ouija board or through going to a psychic, because there is something. That's why when when people go to a psychic, they say, "Wow, I can't believe like that person knew me." Now I know I'm, you know, I got to tell you, I got off ninety percent of my notes, but I just want to share this because we never really hear this stuff. I'm normally the happy preacher. So, but I want to get a little heavy today because I think it's important. Because I think I've seen more, more, more psychics open up on Staten Island than, than ever before. And sometimes people say, wow, I can't believe I went there and this person like knew my Aunt Tilly from, you know, Chattanooga. And, and, there's, and let me tell you, there are the frauds and then there's the legit. Let me tell you. Now, did you ever read in the Bible of something called a familiar spirit? 
What a, what a familiar spirit is, is one of these demons. And a familiar spirit has been linked to a, to a generation, father to son. Remember when we were talking about, you know, uh, a generational curses? There, there are demons that are assigned to territories and locations. Do you know that, that uh, you know, practice homosexuality has been going on literally for hundreds and uh, hundreds and hundreds of years in Greenwich Village? It's no surprise that that just happened. That's always been there. There is an assigned spirit over that. You look at certain communities that have been impoverished. There is a spirit of poverty over certain communities. It, it was one time a, uh, you know, a Jewish ghetto. Then it became a, you know, an Irish ghetto. Then it became an Italian ghetto. Then it became an African American ghetto. Then it became a, you know, a, uh, a Hispanic ghetto. It's there is a assigned spirits over these things, and so let me get back to. The, the fortune teller and, and the familiar spirit. We read about these in the Bible. You can just go through the, uh, you could read the account with, with Paul and so many others. And what a familiar spirit is, is that there is an assigned spirit over, over not only territories, but people. That's why when we say generational curses and we talk about things like incest, or sexual sin. You'll see that sometimes, you know, there's a history of adultery going through a family. Why? Because they're not demon-possessed, but they are demon-oppressed. There is something assigned to them. It's only the blood of Jesus that breaks that, 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 uh, uh, that you know, that stronghold that frees a person from that sin. So what is a familiar spirit, Pastor Marty? Get back on subject, which I'm really off the subject right now. But a familiar spirit knows who your great, 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 can somebody say great? Great grandfather was because he was assigned to him. And so when you go to the psychic, or when hopefully no one here, but when someone goes to the psychic and they say, wow, I can't believe that person knew my Aunt Tilly. Of course that person knew your Aunt Tilly, and they knew your Uncle Bob, and your grandfather Joe, and your great-grandfather Harry, and because they, they, sure they knew, because they've been tracking them and trailing them. But I want you to know there's no reason to fear today in the house, because when you are in blood covenant with Jesus, he has the power to take, a th he, he will take authority over that strong man. Right now, the strong, I want you to raise your hand right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Father, that you would break every stronghold over your people, Lord. I come against a spirit of fear, Lord. I come against a, a spirit of worry and anxiety. I pray, Lord, that you would just fill our hearts with joy, peace. Lord, that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, joy, and a sound mind. And if that's you today, can somebody say amen? I think sometimes when you talk about things like this, we get a little spooked. Come on, can we give God some praise in the house? So somehow this guy gave legal access and, uh, and a legal right for this unclean spirit to come in. And I want you to know that demon possession, like I said, comes in through Ouija boards and mediums and psychics and card readings. And there's also something else. We, I spoke about... I spoke about uh, uh, oppression, demon oppression. Let me tell you, demon oppression comes in different forms. It comes in the form of unforgiveness and bitterness. You ever see people just, like they're just, you know, uh, they're, they're happy, and then when you mention that person's name, like, they just say, you know, it's like you, how many people know the button to push? Right? If you're a wife, you know the button to push for your husband. Husbands, you know the button to push. Kids, teenagers, you know what button to push with your, with your mom and dad. Everybody's got a button. Amen? And, and so what happens is something, that button is really something that oppresses us. It is, you know, it can, it's unforgiveness, it's bitterness, it's the things that we hold on to. Now, that's not a spirit. It's an emotion. But it's something that keeps us 
from entering in. You know, that's why I always tell people when they come to my office and they're thinking about, you know, getting married and they've been married once before, I always tell them, you know, you, you need to make that relationship right with your ex because the way you exited that relationship is the way you're going to enter into another relationship. You know, I will be meeting with a colleague tomorrow because there, there, there's, some, you know, there's just an issue and he just says, hey, Marty, you know, I think these people were one time at ICC and, and, and they, they're coming here now and he says, I'm thanking God for that. He says, but I want to make sure that the way they left ICC is the, the, that, they, that they left in peace so that they can enter here in peace. So we're going there with communion tomorrow. We're going to make, because, we, because unforgiveness and bitterness and anger will plague you all your days. And so what you want to do is you want to be free to live a life that is fruitful. I want everyone here to live a life of peace. But more than that, God wants you to live a life of peace. And all God's people said, amen. Anything that is anti-God is anti-Christ. If something is anti-God, it's anti-Christ. And if something is anti-Christ, it is anti-God. So today, we're going to be talking about how the enemy harassed this man and how he was set free. There are people that have been harassed by the enemy. There are people that have been bound by past hurts, and some have been wounded and betrayed. I tell you, it's one thing to be to be rejected. You know, I don't know if you ever went on a job interview and you go on your job interview, you give some guy your resume and, you know, and, and they look at your resume and they just say, well, you know, I, you know, we, you're, you, you, you know, you, you seem like a great person, but you're just not qualified for the job and they reject us. And rejection hurts. Could someone say amen? But it's another thing to trust someone with your heart, with your life, with your dreams, with your hopes. And when that person uh, uh, rejects you, it's really more than just rejection. It's betrayal. Now you become untrusting. And so, so I think that there's no greater hurt that a human being could face from another person than that of being betrayed. And so what you want to do is you want to make sure that your heart is pure as you take this journey. Some of people have been betrayed by those that they trust the most, a, a parent, a spouse, a brother, a sister, maybe even a pastor. If you've been oppressed by hurt and anger and resentment, the Lord wants to free you from your past, from your hurts. He wants you to move on. He wants you to move forward. He wants you to move deeper in him. I believe that your potential is only reached when you're completely free from the things from your past. You can't run a race. You can't do this journey called life successfully when you're carrying so many hurts on you. You're, for you to enter into a new season, you need to take off the old garments. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is telling someone here today that the wounds of your past were placed on that cross. Well, not that cross. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying that by his stripes you are healed. You are delivered. You've been released from your past. You've been rescued. You've been healed emotionally, spiritually, physically. And you've been liberated by his blood. Today I want you to know that you are free. You are free. You are free in Jesus' name. Could somebody give God some praise in the house today? You know, John 10, 10 tells us that the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's his mission. That's the, that's the mission of the enemy. See, he... That's, that's what he wants to do. Satan wants to hinder you. He wants to defeat you. He wants to distract you. He doesn't, want, he doesn't want to kill you. That may surprise you. See, the enemy does not want to kill a Christian because he knows you'll go to heaven. So he's just going to plague you all the days of your life. He just wants to steal your dreams, and he wants to uh, take your joy away. See, the devil wants to kill your faith. 
He wants to kill your hope. He wants to kill your love for God. He wants to destroy your future and your salvation and your destination. He wants to distract you and he wants to defeat this church. Satan wants to render you powerless and ineffective. But you see, Jesus said this, he says, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have life more abundantly. See, Jesus came to reverse the curse. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I have a life-giving partner, and it's Jesus. See, John 8.32 tells us that when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. If Jesus has come into your life, I want you to know you're no longer a prisoner. You're not on probation anymore. You've been set free. I'm here to tell you that Jesus has defeated Satan totally and completely. He has no power over your life. John 8, 36 tells us, and if the Son sets you free, you are free. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am free in Jesus' name. You know, verse 14 of what we just read tells us that the possessed man could not speak. It was, he was a mute. And I believe someone here needs to speak up. And somebody here needs to get their voice back. Somebody here needs to get their shout back. Somebody here needs to, needs to testify a witness for God. See, when the enemy comes in, he'll make sure that he shuts us down and he shuts us up. I want you to know that when Jesus comes in, he's going to change your language. He's going to change your speech. The devil wants to shut you down. He wants to shut your future down, as a matter of fact. But when that man got delivered, we read that God put a testimony in his mouth. Somebody here needs to speak up. The devil had you down, but you are about to stand up this day. I have to tell you that God has just spoken to my heart that there are going to be lives that are going to be changed today. And I believe it's going to be your life and your life and your life and your life. I believe that God is going to do, by the end of this day, something transformational is going to happen in your life. You know why I know that? Because God spoke it into my heart. Nobody's going to shut down your future. See, that enemy thought, and when we read the scripture, he thought he could shut down that man's future, but he could not shut down that man's future. When he got delivered, he had a testimony. He stood up and he gave some praise to God. No, verse 21 tells us that Jesus invaded Satan's kingdom. You know, Satan has no control over the life of a child of God. I want you to know right now, you know, every chain and every shackle over your life is broken. You are a free man and a free woman. The things of the past, the guilt and the shame of yesterday are broken over your life and you have a future. You know, Jeremiah prophesies, and I believe he prophesies this word over your life today. He says, I know the plans I have for you. See, I, how many people know what's going to happen tomorrow? You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I want you to know this. I want you to know that God has a plan for you. He knows you're tomorrow. He knows, you're, he knows where you were yesterday. He knows where you're at right now. He, God, God knows. You're, he has a plan for you. He has a blueprint of your life written out. He says, and I have given you a hope and a future. You think your life, you know, sometimes I look at myself you know, the other day, yesterday, as a matter of fact, me and my son were talking and and he had some pretty profound things to say to me, to tell you the truth. And I got very quiet because I'm saying, okay, I'm convicted, I'm guilty, you know? And, and he was just sharing his heart with me and he, he had some very important things to say to me. And I'm his dad, but he, I gotta tell you, he was sharing some thoughts 
uh, and, and it was very, uh, was very thought-provoking. But I want you to know that, you know, and he says, you know, Dad, I know you're getting old. You know, I'm 57 years old, but I want you to know it doesn't matter how old you may be, your future is brighter today with Jesus than it was yesterday without him. I, when I think of what, how God has used people, when, when people written them off, don't ever let anyone write you off. Don't let anyone ever shut you down, shut you out, shut you up, keep you down. The Bible, Jeremiah prophesied, and I believe that this is a word for someone here today, that, that, that there is a plan, a hope, and a future for everyone here. And all God's people said, Amen. So we read that, that, that Jesus invaded Satan's kingdom. Satan had no control over the life of a child of God. I'll tell you what, you know, I remember back in the day we would have testimony service. I used to love testimony service because when we would have testimony service, we'd have some people stand up and they, 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 they would just stand up and, and just anybody have something to say. And that's what happened in, in that scripture that we read. Does anybody have something to say? And then somebody, and that, that's what the, the, the mute, that man was mute. But when Jesus delivered him, he gave him a testimony. And when that man stood up, I don't exactly know what he said, but sometimes you hear the testimony of people of where they came from and where they've been. And then all of a sudden you, start, you can sit down and then, then you hear, I was once a drunkard, but now I'm sober and I'm free. I, I, you know, I, was once, I was once suffering from suicide and depression and anxiety. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't move. But then Jesus came into my heart and set me free. You'll hear testimonies. How many people have, have a testimony? Now, now I'm going to do something. I'm going to give. I'm going to. Hey, I'm going to get crazy now. All right. This is. I, I want some. I want three people to give me a one minute testimony. Three people. How many people want, how many, who here wants to give a testimony for one minute? Raise your hand. Come on, don't let the devil shut you down. Look at that. The devil shutting people down here. I need three people. Come here, sister. Come right up here real quick. What has Jesus, where were you and where are you now? You got one minute, sister. Jesus, where was I? I was lost. Lost without the Lord. And I, when I came to the Lord, I had such a difficult time even accepting his love for me. I, I was so under that oppressive spirit of rejection that I didn't even realize that I was good enough to be received into his kingdom. And it took me a while, and I had to pray for that gift of faith to um, receive, receive that gift. And faith is a gift. And if you're struggling in that area of your life in, in, in acceptance, just ask the Lord to give you the faith to believe that what he did and, and who he is and what he will do for you is real. And since then, it's been 29 years, and I, I'm not perfect, but I know that God, I'm not once where I was. I was a cigarette smoker with short shorts up to here and, and, a, and into drugs and into everything. And what God has done in my life and how he's transformed me is more than I could ever begin to be grateful for. See, the devil tried to shut her down. Drugs, smoking, drinking. Sister, did someone here, did you have your hand up? Some, sister, yes? All right, now you got one minute. Okay, um, I had a really bad drug problem, and I got a case, and I got mandated to uh, rehab. And I completed it, and I got saved there. I used to go to church every Sunday. I used to write up the, you know, like the little trip form, so they didn't have a problem with going there. Um, and then I went home, transferred, and I had a relapse. And I wasn't going to church with my mom. She would like write, try to read the Bible to me. I'd be like, get out, get out of my room, leave me alone. Like the enemy has such a strong hold on me. And like, I just let it go. And I was like, I rebuted it. And I like my mom, praying with my mom and I got saved again. And I started going to church and I've been sober for almost three years. I had a little mix up, but. God delivers. He heals. 
I want you to know that wherever you're at, brother, sister, wherever you're at, I don't know the future for this child, but I know one thing. You dedicate that child to God, that child will be a blessing in your old age. God is a healing God. I've seen people bound by anger and set free. I've seen people that, that were just so broken in spirit and God healed them. I've seen doctors give up. I don't know. I've seen doctors give up on people. I've, I've, I've seen people that got out of a, where, where we would see a, a total wreck of a car and the police officers would say, I don't know how they got out of that car, but they got out and they got out alive. God's got a future. Everyone looked at that man in the scripture and just says he's just demon possessed. He's a crazy man. Keep away from him. God had a plan for him. I don't know what that man turned out to be, but he wasn't what he was before Jesus came in. I want you to know that if we were to continue and we had our testimony service here, man, the testimonies would knock your socks off. Because you know what happened? Somebody, somebody established a covenant with God. Someone got on their knees and said, God, would you help me? God, would you heal me? God, would you restore me? God, would you change my heart? God, would you fix my mind? God, would you heal my body? And God is a God that can do anything on your behalf. I just want you to know, saints, that we need, if we're to run this race, we need to run this, we need to take this journey with Jesus. Man, I've seen people, their life was in a prison, an emotional prison, but God set them free. If we had a testimony service here, we would hear people say that, oh, I was a complainer and I was a worry ward and I was a grumbler and I was a fear monger. But then I established covenant with God and, and God put a song in my mouth. He put praise in my heart. God has given someone here a new beginning. I assure you this. In the next 15 minutes, when I finish this message, someone's life is going to be radically changed. Man, he can change your speech. He'd give you a new dance. He'd give you a new walk. He'd give you a new spirit. This is radical relationship. This is not church as usual. This is radical relationship. Radical relationship cannot be contained. It cannot be limited or restricted. You know, verse 21 and 22 tells us that, that the devil was called the strong man. He may be strong, but I want you to know that God is almighty. And Jesus defeated Satan on the cross, and he, and he took the fight to him. He invaded his territory and he overpowered him and defeated him. Verse 22 tells us that Jesus has claim over Satan's kingdom. Satan's weapons and armor, he has been dismantled and disarmed. No weapon formed against you shall prosper in Jesus' name. There's no weapon, no demon, there's no plan that can defeat the child of God. Greater is he that is within me than he that is within the world. And I have a word for someone today. If you're a believer, but you feel empty inside, I want you to know that there's something more than just a Sunday sermon. And Paul asked the question and he said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And today I'm praying that someone's heart space would be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm believing that someone's mind will contain the fullness of God. And I'm praying that someone's spirit will 
overflow with the presence of his holiness. Jesus is saying to us that we were created by him and for him. And the purpose of Sal, the purpose of the Christian is to be the church. You are the church. You are the temple. You are the container. You are the vessel of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to establish a tabernacle with you. You know, there was a testimony of a, from an, uh, an Assemblies of God missionary. Listen to what he wrote. He wrote that a spiritualist, that's a person involved in the occult, wanted a certain house, wanted to purchase a house. So he made a deal with a demon during a seance that if you give me this house, I will give the devil my soul. And that demon manifested itself to him. And days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months. And that man conjured up that spirit again. And when he asked the demon, he says, I promised you my, my soul, and how come I did not get my house? And the demon said this. The demon said, because there was a wall of fire around that house, I couldn't get in. There's a Christian living there filled with the Holy Spirit, praying. I tried to enter into that house, and I could not find a gap. I could not find an entranceway. Amen. This morning, I pray a wall of fire around you, around your children. I'm praying for hope. Praying for deliverance. Church, just put your hands on your heart right now. I just feel impressed to do this right now. And I'd like you to repeat this. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit. I am filled with the power of God. I have been empowered by the Son of God. I am redeemed I am sanctified. I am sold out. I am consecrated. I am separated. I am blood bought. I am blood washed. I am saved. And I pray no gaps. 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 Pray no gaps. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Give God some praise. You know, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is so much more than just praying in tongues, as some would just have it said. It's giving every room, every closet, it's giving your, your, the, the, the secret places of your life to the presence of God. It's putting his firewall around your life. It's protecting you and your family from the enemy. Would you just turn around and tell two people, no more gaps? No more gaps. No, tell them, no more gaps. So how do you resist the devil? The Bible says, resist the devil and he should flee. So how do we resist the devil? Not by trying harder. Not by more rules or religion. But by being in his presence. By staying filled with his spirit. The most dangerous place is an empty place. Be filled. Stay filled. Be overflowing. And I believe someone here needs to make covenant with God and they need to build an altar before the Lord. If that's you, would you say amen? amen. Have you received today's message? Amen. 
Now, I, want, I have some questions for you, saints. If you've been emotionally and spiritually in a battle, I'd just like you to raise your hands and put them down. If you've been struggling with a feeling of dread and terror and dismay, just raise your hand. Put your hand down. Could we get some of the musicians up here? If you've been warring with the same struggles day after day and time after time in your marriage, if you've been struggling with the same, having the same battles with your children or maybe even with, uh, with a personal addiction, with resentment or, or anger, would you just raise your hands real, real high and put them right down? If you want Jesus to give you the power and the victory over your life, if you want the Holy Spirit to be a permanent residence in your house, I'd like you to raise your hand real high. Would you stand with me, church? you raised your hand I'd like you to come forward right now I don't want you to be ashamed you know what we're going to do we're going to establish an altar a covenant you raised your hand I'd like you to come forward I believe here in the presence of God He's a God that's going to do something exceeding, exceedingly great. I believe that there's going to be healing and deliverance, freedom. We're going to establish an altar of power. You know, in the Old Testament, it says that the prophet... went before the prophets of Baal and God rained down fire and destroyed the works of the enemy right now in Jesus name I believe that every stronghold is going to be broken over your life in Jesus name I believe that anger and depression fear Hatred, rage is going to be broken over your life. Feelings of guilt and shame are going to be broken. The sins of the past are going to be broken. God is going to establish a new covenant with you. He's going to put away the old covenant. Today we're going to build something for God and a tabernacle, a place, a meeting place with the Lord. We're going to establish a tabernacle of praise. And I believe there's today someone is going to get power and victory. If that's you and you're still out there, I want you to know, today we're going to pray a prayer of power and victory. If you need power and victory in your life, I want you to come forward right now. I believe that God will respond to your faith. God won't respond just to your words. He's going to respond to your feet. He's going to respond to your feet because somebody said, I'm going to walk to the master and I'm going to tabernacle with God and I'm going to build something. If you need, if you want to walk in power, if you want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to come right now. If you need healing in your heart, healing in your emotions and in your mind, come. You know, the Lord just dropped something in my heart when I was preparing this. And I just saw this when I was in prayer, and it may not mean something to most people here, but something the Lord just dropped into my heart was I saw an open gate. 
I saw an open door. I saw an untraveled pathway. And I said, Lord, what does this mean? And he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take people where they've never been before. I'm going to open up a door that's been shut to them. I'm going to bring, I'm going to open up a season of favor and grace over their lives. If you've been praying for an open door, if you've been praying for a new season, you need to travel down that untraveled road. And God, I said, God is going to meet you there. No more gaps. No more things that are going to keep you hindered. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray, Father, for the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, that you would move in a powerful way. Pastor Chris, are you here right now? If Pastor Chris is here, just come forward. Let's just start laying hands on people. In Jesus' name, if we have some vocals right now, Sister Marisol, Lori, someone come up here. Right now, in Jesus' name, I pray the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. Every shackle, every chain broken over your life. In Jesus' name, new pathways, new beginnings, a new hope, a new life in Jesus' name. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would restore the hearts of your people. Lord, that you would renew our strength, Lord. Lord, we give you praise, honor, and glory in this place. Right now, Lord, every prison door open. Lord, every heart that has been in prison shall be free in Jesus' name. By the blood of the Lamb, I come against every generational curse, Lord. I come against every mocking spirit, Lord. Everything that has shamed us and made us feel guilty, Lord. In Jesus' name, touch our minds. Heal our hearts, Father, as we give you praise, honor, and glory. We're going to sing a song, church, and then we're going to pray a closing prayer. And I mean, Pastor Chris is just going to lay hands on you and believe God for a miracle right now. In Jesus' name.